So there was a follow-up question on whether uh, under certain mode, under certain special cases, you could have strength, stress tensors evaluating to the same numerical value. This can happen under special states of deformation. Um, it may be of, of a little use to, uh, of, of some use to uh, look at what happens with uh, uniaxial deformation, okay, or uniaxial tension. Okay, so let's look at the stress tensors. for uniaxial um, deformation. Okay, so let's recall the picture. Okay, let's make sure that this is E1, E, E1, this has to be E3, and that is E2. Okay, uh, let's do the reference configuration. Okay, uh, this is omega naught, and we have a force F as we wrote originally. Okay. Uh, cross-sectional area pi r square and length capital L, okay? This undergoes deformation, gets nice and elongated. Okay, uh, the force remains the same. This is omega sub t by little r square and that length is little l. Okay, so let's just write out all the stress tensors, right? Um, easy enough to write our p, okay? Because p is just, um, let, let me note now somewhere, let me note, uh, maybe just above this, let me note that F, the way we've written it is F E1, okay? Right, that's F without the underbar, it's just the magnitude of F. Okay, so then what we see is that P equals little f over pi r square E1 tensor E1, sigma is little f uh, over pi little r square E1 tensor E1. Okay, what about f? Okay, remember f is the deformation gradient. Okay, it gives us um, it, 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 in, in this particular case F can be written as um, if you think about it F turns out to be the following right it, uh, we, can, we can just write F in terms of each of the stretches right so each of the, stre the, the stretches give us the following uh, along the e1 direction we have little L over capital L e1 tensor e1 plus along the other two directions, we have uh, little r over capital R, E2, tensor E2, plus E3, tensor E3. Okay? All right? Um, now, of course, we, we, we noted that there was a relation. If, if this thing is incompressible, let's assume that it, uh, does it have to be incompressible? Well, it doesn't have to be. If we, if we make it incompressible, we need to introduce some other conditions there. So let's not assume that it's, in, it's incompressible, okay? It is compressible. Okay. Um, what we can do now is, um, right, so this is F. Now, now note some things. 
Though I said that in general, it did not make sense to ask if, if P were symmetric, this is a case where P is indeed symmetric. This is also a case where it's just the matrix that we would compute for P, which turns out to be symmetric, okay? If you, if you think back to my answer to the previous question, the fact that the force has the spatial nature, whereas the, the, the reference area has this uh, reference nature, still says that there is no physical significance to this quantity being symmetric. There is, however, physical significance to this quantity being symmetric because it implies the, the balance of angular momentum. All right? Also note that, once again, in this case, um, F is, is symmetric. Okay, it's not usually the case, right? So even though F admits this, de this decomposition of um, RU, okay, this is a case in which R is the, what is R? Is there any rotation here? No. So R is just the isotropic tensor, okay? And in fact, U is the same as F in this case. Okay, special case. But what about the Kirchhoff stress? Okay, J sigma. Now J is final volume over reference volume. Sorry. Okay. Um, F over pi little r square, okay, E1 tensor E1, okay, because this is sigma, all right? So in this case, what do we see? We see that we get L over pi r square L, F, E1, tensor E1. And then we observe that actually when we combine these guys, right, we see P lurking in there. So this is actually little L over capital L, P. All right. And finally, uh, what is F inverse? F inverse is uh, L over L, E1 tensor E1 plus R over little r, E2 tensor E2 plus E3 tensor E3, okay? S, which is F inverse P, is L over L. It's all of this stuff, right? E1, tensor E1. I'm going to write this out in detail so we see how things work out. Plus R over R, E2, tensor E2 plus E3, tensor E3, okay? Uh, all of this is F inverse acting on P. P was F over pi capital R square E1, tensor E1, okay? So all of this is F inverse. And this is P. So now when we put things together, we see that because of the fact that E1, E2, E3 form a, an orthonormal set, uh, any action of E2 or E3 on E1 is going to drop out, okay, because of the orthonormality. And the only thing that survives then is uh, F, um, capital L over little l, pi, capital R square, E1, tensor E1, okay, this is S. 
So now if you look at S here, uh, you look at uh, tau here, right? This is tau. Right? And um, we look at sigma and, and, and P. Let's, let's just write them all again just so that we see what, what all the relations are. Sigma is F over pi r square E1 tensor E1. Okay? P turns out to be R square over capital R square sigma. So yeah, butchered this R. Okay? Uh, two tends to, will, will become, what did we see? We saw that tau was, um, um, well, we related it to capital P, okay? So tau was little l over capital L P, which is, uh, what is it? It is now L R square over capital L R square sigma. And finally, S we found to be, um, okay, we found F to be, uh, sorry, S to be capital L over little l p, capital L over little l p, which is, um, right, it is L R square over L R square sigma. Okay, so there you have all the stresses in terms of sigma. So they're all similar, they're just different by, uh, by they're, you know, they're just scaled differently. Okay, and this is, a, this is all because we have uniaxial uh, deformation here. And then it, it is just the effect of the change in volume, uh, the change in length and, 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 and radii, which gives us different uh, uh, magnitudes for these stresses, right? But their orientations are all the same.